recording. So um, welcome everyone to Python lesson four. So um, in the previous lessons, I sort of felt like we were dealing with a lot of uh, kind of annoying background things that we needed to know about, um, but that were not really core to programming. And I feel like this week is really a week where we're starting to get into the kinds of tools where you can actually, um, where you can actually um, start doing some real programming. So the focus of this is on um, the first of the sort of built-in um, data structures. So last week we talked about m complicated objects that we built ourselves. Um, but this week and next week, we are going to be talking about um, two important data structures that um, are, are more complicated, but that are built into Python. Um, lists, and then next week we'll talk about dictionaries. And I also want to mention that there are some other data structures that people use that aren't a part of the basic Python package, but that are kind of add-ons. Um, there's an important uh, data science package called pandas and another one called NumPy. And NumPy in particular creates some some larger data structures than these, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. But um, if you're interested in that, the other class that we're doing, which is the intermediate um, uh, uh, intermediate Python for uh, data visualization and other things like that, we talk about those. So, and those are also recorded. So, if you're curious, um, please feel free to look at those recordings. So um, the, the most simple sort of of the data structures that Python has is what's known as a list. So you can think of a list as really kind of like a stack of variables. Um, and so in the list, you, you don't have a place to store just one thing, but it's a variable where you can store many things. So, and often we try to create some kind of a name for the list that indicates what sort of things we're going to store in there. So I've created this list I call basket. And in this list, it has five slots to put things in. And so I've put the names of five different fruits in this basket. So you can you should recall that um, I said in Python, when we do indexing of things, or it's sort of like counting things, we always count from zero. So if you're used to other programming languages like R that count from one, this may be sort of confusing, but in Python, we always start counting from zero. So if we want to refer to a particular slot in this list, we use a square bracket notation and we say basket square bracket zero to refer to the first item and square bracket two for the third item or item number two. Um, if we want to create a list, uh, this shows how we do it here. You put the name, the assignment operator, and then you put square brackets with the list of all the things separated by commas. This particular list is a list of strings, but a list can also um, consist of any other kind of Python object. It can consist of numbers, it consist, can consist of Booleans. You can also have mixed lists where some things are numbers and some things are strings. So there's, it's really pretty wide open in terms of what you're allowed to put in the list. The other thing that, that we can do is, in addition to specifying particular items in the list, <clears throat> we can also do what's called slicing, which is where we create another list that contains just a subset of the things that are in our first list. So if we say, um, uh, basket one colon four. Hmm, I should have these brackets extending down here. This would be items one, two, three, and four, and it would generate a new list that contained only those things. So let's uh, try playing around with this a little bit. So uh, just as a reminder, if you start at the vanderbilt.lt slash pi page and scroll down to lesson four, That'll take you to the web page for this week. Um, and the easiest way is to use uh, the Google Co-Laboratory Notebook. So you can just open this link 
uh, it'll take you to the CoLab notebook. It, on your screen, it may you may have to click on a button in the top to actually open it in CoLab. And then um, this is the is my spreadsheet that I've shared with you. If you want to have your own copy that you can edit and save, go to the file menu and say save a copy in Drive, and then it will show up in your Google Drive as a separate uh, lit, as a separate uh, notebook. So I've already done that here and you can see it says copy of list. That's how I know that this isn't my original one, but it's actually a copy that is editable. So does anybody have any having any problems with that so far? Okay, I, nobody's indicating they have a problem, so let's go ahead and move on. So here's the example that I showed you on the slide. And you may remember, I think it was last week where I said you can use the length function, L-E-N, to find out how many characters there are in a string. You can also use it to find out how many items there are in a list. So here I'm, I'm taking the number of items in the list, passing it into a variable called how many, and then telling the uh, computer to show me what that is. All right, and it says there are five. So even though the items are numbered zero through four, if you ask how many they are, there are, the answer will be the number of things, which is five, not the number of the last thing, which is four. Okay, and then here's the example of, uh, of taking a slice of the basket. So if I do this, it shows me items one through, oh yeah, I forgot about this. <laughs> This is the crazy thing that Python does. When you specify a range of things, it goes to one less than the last thing you put on the list. So that was why I was throwing myself off on this slide here. So if I say basket one colon four, it's actually going to give me items one, two, and three because it always does one item less than the end of the range that you're showing there. And um, this is a kind of puzzling behavior to most people, but that's the way it works in uh, Python. And you'll notice that when you say to print that slice, it shows it in square brackets, with it, which is an indication that the new thing that we've made, that we've made, the slice here, is itself actually a list that has two items in it. And we, if we ask how long those, the list is, it'll say two. And then here are some of the other kinds of manipulations we can do. Uh, we can ask for item number four. Um, here we're saying we want items zero to how many, and how many we said was the length of the list. So the length of the list was five. So this is going to give us item zero colon five, which is one more than the item number of the last item on the list. So going from zero to the length of the list actually gives us all the items in the list. And I'm kind of wondering if that's the reason why Python does that weird thing of specifying one number higher than the actual last item on the list. That, that way, if you say the length of the list, you'll get the whole list. Um, and then the last two, let's go ahead and run this and, and think about why we get the results that we do for the last two items. So here we ask for item number four, that was line. Then we ask for zero through the length of the list and we got the whole list. Now, can anybody explain what's the difference between what I did in the last two lines here? Any ideas about that? can put it in the chat if you have any clues. Um, is it because when you, when you call it, like when you put it like, you know, brackets zero colon one, mm -hmm. it's creating a new, I don't know, is it creating a, a new, new list, list or new object? Okay. Well, so like pretty much everything is an object in Python, but it's, it is created, creating a new object that is a list. Right. If I say item number zero, like I did here, I just get the first item. Here, I'm creating a new list that only has one item in it that is 
apple. And so if I um, if I say uh, if I tell it to print the uh, type of thing that um, that this is. And if I tell it to print the uh, type of thing that this is, let's see what happens. Yeah, so it says this one basket square bracket zero is a string, but this one is a list. So that's the difference between the two. Okay, great. Yep, the second one. So the second one, I'm just gonna, in the chat, um, it says the second one is a range, and I'm just going to be a little bit careful because later down in the lesson, we're actually going to define a range to be a different kind of thing. So it's, it does include a range of items, but the kind of thing it is is actually another list. And, and we'll see how a range is different from a list towards the end of the lesson. All right, great. Let's go back to the slides. And uh, so we can manipulate things on lists in several ways. Uh, if we want to replace an item in a list, we just use the assignment operator and we can say change item number one by um, assigning tangerine to it. We can also add items to a list by using the append method. So remember last time we learned that for our user defined objects, uh, the, the um, the objects that we built, that we defined ourselves, we could have methods for them. So for complicated objects like lists, we, they can have methods as well. So the dot append method takes the um, argument that we put into it and appends it or adds it to the end of the list. Um, so it doesn't, this does not return a value. We can't say basket dot append or you know, something equals basket dot append. We just say basket.append and it, it does something. It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't output something. It just does something to the list itself. Um, and then there's a couple other commands that we can use. So for instance, if we want to create a list that doesn't have anything in it, we can just put square brackets with nothing in it. Now, it may seem kind of weird to do that, but we'll see uh, a situation later on why this could be a useful thing. We can also um, use the remove method to uh, put the, so in the remove method, you, you put as the attribute the thing that you want to remove. So if it's like a string, you actually say which string you want to remove. That's a little different from the delete, which also can be used to remove an item, but in that case, it, it's not actually a method, it's a command. So that's why you see it. the method has a dot, but the command has a space. So here we're saying remove item number three. So let's go back to the notebook and try some of these out. Okay, so uh, here's the list. So we print the whole list. Now if we change item number one to tangerine, we can see that item number one has changed from orange. We've replaced it with tangerine. And here's, like I said, the remove method. We say, what is the thing we want to remove? We specify we want to remove banana, so it should take banana out. Okay, so there's the list without banana. And if we want to append or add an item to the end of the list, we can use the append method. So now we see that it's added durian to the end of the list. And then here is what the delete um, command looks like. So delete space, and then we say the thing we want to delete. We say we want to delete item number zero. That's going to get rid of apple. And we can see that now apple is gone. Another thing that you can do is um, you can add two lists together. Um, we saw that the plus operator is used several ways. It's used for addition. It's used to concatenate strings. It's also used to add one list onto the end of another. And actually, 
we can sort of think of strings as basically being like lists of characters. And so if we use the, con the concatenate operator on two strings, it basically joins them end to end. And since strings are just about like lists, then using the plus operator for two lists also joins them end to end. So it takes sandwich and cookie and then adds after it whatever was left of my list after I got done messing around with it to create one larger list. Um, okay, question, can you add items to the middle of existing lists? And the answer is yes. Um, I am not uh, remembering what the command for that is, but uh, it's, uh, it, is, it is definitely possible to do that. And I will, I'd have to look that up. Um, so, uh, sorry, I can't give you an immediate answer for that. The next thing that I want to talk about here is, is um, I would say, maybe an advanced topic, but it's something that I want you to know is, is a thing, because it's one of those gotchas where you can get yourself in trouble if you don't know about it. So I mentioned last week that um, for simple objects like uh, a, a an object that's just a string variable or a numeric variable, if you assign that variable to another variable, you make a copy of the first variable. And then those two variables are independent of each other. If you do something to one, it doesn't have any effect on the other. But for more complex objects like the user-defined ones we saw last week, and for things like lists and dictionaries, if you use the assignment operator to take a variable that contains a list and assign it to another variable, you don't actually make a separate copy of the first variable. Instead, what you're doing is making a reference back to the first variable. And so what that means is that if you, if you copy or, or assign a variable to another variable and then you change the new variable, it also changes the original one as well. And I think I've, I've spent an hour trying to troubleshoot a program because I didn't realize that this happened and I couldn't figure out why the original um, list was being changed. So it turns out there's an, a function uh, called deep copy that's in the copy module. Uh, and if we look at uh, the example on the web page, you, you can see here's an example of how to do it here. And I'm gonna let you uh, try these examples on your own and see if you can understand how they work. Um, one thing that I'll just mention right now, when we talked about modules and functions that are in modules, we said that you put the name of the module, a dot, and then the function that's in the module. But we also talked about objects having methods, and the, and the notation was the same. You had the object, and then a dot, and then you had the method. So there's really not, when you see an object with a method and a module with a function that's in it, they basically look the same, but really you can almost think about them as the same kind of thing. So um, it's, it's maybe a little confusing why one time I'll say, you know, here is a, uh, an object that we're performing a method on, and then down here I say, here is a module that has a function because the notation of those two um, things are the same. All right, well, I, I will, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just let you play around with that on your own um, and talk about what I think is a more uh, important thing, and that is lists of lists. So when I um, talked about lists originally, I said that you can basically put any kind of object in a list. You can put strings, you can put booleans, you can put numbers. You can also put other lists inside of lists. So here I have a list that the, um, the outer list here uh, is these uh, black square brackets. But inside this outer list, I have three items separated by the black commas. And those three items are this first list, which is in blue, the second list, which is in red, and the third list, which is in purple. So if I want to diagram this out, this is what it looks like. Here is my, if you want to call it the outer list, 
And then inside each slot in the outer list, I have an inner list, the red one, the, the blue one, the red one, and the purple one. And like anything else, I can refer to the first list, the second list, and the third list by index numbers like this. Data zero is the first list, data two is the is list number two. Um, if I wanted to, I could draw them diagra diagrammatically like this and show that inside this outer list, there's basically a tiny little inner list. And so if I want to refer to one of the numbers that's inside one of the inner list, I first put the index of the outer list. So the outer list index number is zero. That's this box here. And then within the outer zero list, I have the inner list item number two, which I show with the second square bracket. So when you see a list name with two square brackets after it, the first one means basically the outer list, and the second one basically means the inner list. Now, how I choose to um, show, uh, diagram these, this is all sort of like a conceptual thing anyway, but it's actually convenient if I, if instead of showing the inner lists vertically, if I show the inner list horizontally, then you can see that essentially what I've created is like a little table. And so if you want to think of a two-dimensional list like this as a table, then the first index number in the first square bracket represents the row of the table, and then the second square bracket represents the column or the position in that row. So if I want to refer to the item in row number 0, 1, 2 and column 0, 1, 2, 3, I would say data square bracket 2 square bracket 3, and that's how I would indicate um, this here. So what I've done is essentially created a list of lists uh, that we can think of a table. And in some programming languages, there's actually a built-in thing like this that is called an array. And uh, in fact, if you use NumPy, NumPy actually defines a special data structure that is an array like this. But we can build an array basically out of making a list of lists. And that's how we'll do it in this class. So let's go to the um, try this yourself. And um, so here is how I, here is the command to assign that complicated list of lists to a, a variable called data. And oh, it looks like I need to turn notifications off here. Uh, how do I do that? Hmm. Do not disturb. That's what I want. Uh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> the dangers of having your phone account on your computer. Um, okay, so here is, okay, so, and then here we are taking item row two, item zero, the first one, let's try that. Okay, so the row number two, which is this array number two, and then item number zero, which is negative 99, that's what we get right there. Now, if we ask what is the length of the list, can anybody predict what, what that's going to be? You can write it in the chat or say it if you want. I thought it was going to be 12, but I found out I was wrong. Yeah, well, so if we ask about the overall list, we're asking about the, uh, the outer list, which would be um, the big black thing. And it has actually three items, one, two, three. So we should, it should say three because we have a list of three things and those three things is, a, is e each of those three things is another list. Now, if we specify just list number one, which is the second one, this one here, and then ask how long the list number one is, then it should say 
four because then we're specifying list number one, which is this one here. And I suppose there's probably a, a command to find out how many items there are in both lists, but I don't remember what it is. So uh, that's again something you can look up. I'm sure there is a, a way to do it. Okay, uh, I mentioned that um, strings you can essentially think of as a list whose items are characters. And so many of the things that we can do with lists, like take slices of them, you can do with um, strings as well. Uh, just to review, I mentioned before that we had that we could create special non uh, typable or non printing characters like new lines, which would be a hard return or tab characters by using backslashes. So uh, and then so backslash n does not mean the letter n, it means one character, a new line character. And we can actually use what's known as Unicode, which is a, a coding system for all different kinds of characters. There's like thousands of different character sets, all different languages and so on. And to express a Unicode character number in hexadecimal, it takes four, uh, four hexadecimal digits. So you write um, backslash u, that basically means this is a Unicode character, and then there are uh, four, um, uh, the four digits that specify what that character is. So this is how you could include in your code things like uh, characters from other languages, things like diacritics, special symbols, and things like that. Um, the way that you specify substrings is the same way that you do with the list. If you say, if you have a string and you say my word three, it will give you character number three, which is not the third character. Uh, if you say my word two colon five, that will give you characters two through four. So the same thing I said before about the, this goofy thing that Python does where it doesn't actually give you the last item you, that you specify in, in the range uh, is, applies with this as well. And then there are several other methods that you can play around with. If you say, if you put the name of a, a string and you say dot upper, it will change all the characters into uppercase. You can also take a string, a string and split it into pieces by uh, using the split command. So you say split, and then the argument that you pass in to that method is the character that you want it to split by. And then what it does, the output of that split method is actually a list of strings. So if there are three things separated by commas, you'll end up with a list of those three things. And we saw this, um, I didn't talk about it, but last week in the um, poem object, we had those methods for like, uh, dividing the poem into words or into stanzas or into lines that I use the split command to do that. So um, in the notebook here I have a bunch of different examples of things you can try and again in the interest of time I'm going to let you just play around with these on your own um, and see how they work but just as one illustration I here is an example of using the Unicode character for Euro, the Euro symbol, which is 20AC. So if I say backslash U, which indicates it's a Unicode character, then Python will, will not print the next four characters after that, but rather will interpret them as a four hexadecimal code for whatever Unicode character I want. And in this case, it's the Euro character. So if I say run this, it says that's 2182 euros. Um, so this is a convenient thing if you want to include in your code characters that you can't print otherwise. And there are some other examples of that in here. Then here is an example of showing how you can um, get bits of strings. So here, <clears throat> if I say, um, uh, 
Nobel Peace Prize two, it should give me character number two. Remember we count from zero, so this should print G. Let's try it. Okay, so G. Then if I ask for characters 12 through 15, let's see what happens. Okay, characters 12 through 15 is actually this. So character 12 is J. Character 13 is the Unicode character, which is this. And then character number 14 is the L. So even though I'm highlighting way more than just three characters, this Unicode character in here actually only counts as one character, um, or that's how Python interprets it. Okay, and then here are the different methods that I um, told you about. So um, the title uh, is, uh, produces title case, which means it capitalizes the first word of each thing. Um, and then here I'm telling it to split it by spaces and turning it into uppercase. So let's try that. Okay, so the first thing I did is turn this into title case. So we see that here. Um, and then, hmm, oh, I see. I only told it to print that one thing here. If I say, um, print the third word. So here I told, uh, when I did the split command, uh, it split it, it has one, two, three, four, five words. So it split it into words zero through four. And I asked for word number two, which is zero, one, two, that's gonna be of. Um, and then here's the uh, uppercase. And then um, here's the replace command. So this is sort of like replacing um, a slice of a list. You can also replace um, parts of a string that way. All right. Uh, does anybody want have any questions about strings and how you play around with them? I think this is fairly uncomplicated, especially if you have a chance to play with it. All right, well, if nobody has any questions, then let's talk about the last a uh, new topic of today's lesson, which is um, iterating. So one of the things, uh, so there's several useful things that a computer script can do for you. One of them, which we'll talk about, uh, what I guess we talked about last time was making decisions by using if. The other really cool thing that scripts can do is to do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and that's called iterating. And so in a, a lot of programming languages have an iterating command called for, and Python also does that as well. So what you do in the for command is you, you have the word for, and then you say for, and then you give a variable name, and then in, and then the thing that you wanna iterate through. And the way this works is the first time it iterates through the list basket, it makes fruit have the value of the first slot. The second time it iterates, the um, second value of fruit is used. And then the third time it assigns the third value to fruit, the fourth time the fourth value and so on. So what this does is basically it steps through each of the items in the list and it assigns each of those items to fruit, uh, a different item each time it does that. So any kind of thing that you can step through one item at a time is called iterable. And we'll see several other examples of iterable things. So, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a list is an example of an iterable thing. Strings are also iterable things because you can step through them one letter at a time. 
and we'll see a couple other examples of iterable things. So any kind of iterable thing you can use in a for, uh, we call it a for loop. So, oh, I forgot to mention then, we see that um, the same kind of trick that we did with like try except and if and some other, uh, uh, oh, and uh, defining functions, we have this thing where we have a colon and the colon basically says, get ready for an indented code block. So whatever is indented at the same indentation level is the code that will be executed each time an iteration happens. Then when the indentation drops back out again to the same level as four, then that's where it'll pick up after it finishes iterating through the code. So if we look at this example here, um, it will iterate through each of the fruits. And the thing that I'll do each time is to print I ate one, and then it'll add on the name of whatever the particular fruit is for that iteration. After it's iterated through all the items in the list, then it pops back out to where it's not indented and it'll continue with that code there. So uh, let's um, go back to our examples and try actually doing this. So, so what it's doing is the first time it says I print one and since fruit is apple the first time it says I ate one apple. And then the second time the value of fruit is orange so it says I ate one orange. And the same thing with banana, lemon, and lime. After it's iterated through each of the five items in the list, it continues on with the non-indented code here, and it says, I'm full now. And as I said, you can do the same kind of thing with strings. So here's a very long string that I'm assigning to the variable called word. And then I'm going to say, iterate through each character in that string and assign it to the variable word. And then each time it does one of those iterations, it's going to print whatever the letter is at that time. And after it's done iterating through every letter in the string, it'll jump back out to the same indentation level I started with, and it'll say that wore me out. So let's try that. So it printed each of the letters one at a time. Any questions about um, the terminology we're using here, or the structure of the for loops? I have a quick question, Steve. Sure. Um, so for this last example, or these last two examples, mm -hmm. Python was able to pick up that each item and basket will now be, that is fruit. Like it was able to, you didn't have to assign fruit to each yes. of those items. And the same thing for letters in the word. It just yes. assumes, okay. That's, if a, that's the way for works. It, it, it assigns to whatever variable you put in this position, each of the things one at a time. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. So um, this method of doing for is useful if you have a list of things or, or a, a, a list of characters or something like that that you want to step through. But what if you don't want to step through something? What if you just want to do something a whole bunch of times and not actually step through a list of things? That's where ranges come in. So I mentioned um, that ranges are slightly different. Uh, I mean, we can talk about a range of things in a list, but technically what a range is, it is an iterable thing that basically generates a series of numbers. And so what you do is you, um, as arguments, you put inside the range function the starting, the, the number you want to start with, and then one more than the number you want to end with. So this goofy thing that I mentioned before about it going, it only going to one less than the last number you put in applies with the range function as well. So if I want it to iterate through the numbers one through 10, I say range parentheses one comma 11, 
And so each time you iterate, it'll be one, then it'll be two, then it'll be three, then it'll be four, all the way up to 10. If you want it to skip numbers, you can add a third argument, which tells you how, what the interval is that you want to skip by. So if you want it to count by twos, you can say comma two, and then it'll say two, four, six, eight, but it will not do 10 because it always skips the last one. You can also use the, um, you can make the step be negative, um, and in that case, it counts down. So if we use this range, it'll go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, but it will not do zero because it always quits one before the last thing. The reason why we might want to, to um, use range is, well, as I said, one example is if we don't actually, um, if we just simply want it to do something a whole bunch of times, but we also might want to have it use the numbers that we're iterating through in some sort of way. So for example, if we want it to, to go through the numbers one through 10, and then for each one of them, show me what the square of the number is, then I could use this code here. So I'll uh, say for number in, and then here's my iterable thing, range one comma 11, so it's gonna be, so the first time the loop goes, number will be one. The second time, number will be two. The third time, number will be three. And then I can use the value of number in this indented code block here. So the first time, it's going to take whatever the number is and square it and assign that to the variable called the square. And then it's going to take whatever the square is and multiply it by pi, and that's going to give me the area. So then I can say print number comma, and then here's a tab symbol. So it'll tab over to line things up and then it'll print the area. And it'll do this indented code block for all the numbers from one to 10. And when it's done, then it'll jump out here and it'll say, these are the areas of all the circles. So basically range is good if we want to use the value of the range inside the code block somewhere. And one of the things that is very common is to use the length of a list as the end of a range. So this is sort of like when we did the whole colon thing to define a slice, and we said we can put length of the list as the thing after the colon, and that gives us the whole list. The same thing is true here on range. If we say length of the list as the end of the range, then it'll essentially count through all the, it will iterate through all the items in the list. Um, so I'll, I'll show you an example of that uh, next. Okay, so here we are uh, just counting from one to 10. And you can see, as I said, it, it, it does not do the last item. Here is an example of um, counting backwards. So it says, prepare to launch 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, lift off. Okay, then this is a kind of tricky one. So let's think about what this is gonna do. So this is actually a, a trick uh, that we'll use several times, a number of times in the future. You, as you may recall, I said um, that we uh, sometimes wanna create an empty list and why would we wanna do that? Well, that would be a situation where we would create an empty list and then use a loop to add items to it one at a time. And that's sort of like what we're doing here. Here we're creating a thing called an empty string. This is a string, a, a string literal that basically doesn't have anything in it. And then each time we run the loop, it is going to add whatever the new thing is that we're making along with the old thing that was already there. So what it'll do, cheer starts off as nothing. And then the first time the loop executes, it's gonna take the string value of the number and add it on to whatever was in the string before and then put a comma. So it'll, so the first time it does this, skipper will be two. So it'll take nothing and add two, add the character two and a comma and a space. Then the second time skipper will be four. 
so it'll take what I had before, which is two comma space and add four comma space, and then it'll be six, and then it'll be eight, um, and it will not do 10 because it always skips the last one. So let's try that. So it says two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? And I was able, so I mean, if all you had to do was um, count to eight, it'd be just as easy to type this out. But what if I say, um, from two to a thousand. Okay, wow. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I only did a hundred. All right, well, I'm not going to do a thousand because I'm afraid it'll like fill up my whole screen. But, well, heck, let's do it. Why not? Okay, so you can see that the, the like I said, the power of a script is that. It doesn't get tired if you tell something to do, if you tell it to do something a whole bunch of times. And so it would be hard to type out every second number going up to a thousand by hand, but super easy to do it with a tiny little script. Okay, and then the last example is a kind of complicated one. So let's walk through this and make sure that we understand what's going on here. So um, here is my list of, of, um, of uh, fruits. And what I want to do is to print them out one at a time. If I only wanted to just print each fruit one at a time, I could just say for fruit in basket, right? So why am I saying for fruit in range zero to length of basket? The reason is that I want, not only do I want to print out the fruits, but I also want them to be numbered. And the way I'm going to do that is by using, if I say, Zero. Okay, so first of all, what is the length of the basket? One, two, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. There are five items in the list numbered zero through four. So the range is going to be zero, comma, five, which will give me items, the numbers for items zero, one, two, three, and four, which is all of the items on the list here. Then what I do, here I am saying print, the, add one to the number. So item number zero is going to be, have one added to it, so it'll be one, and then turn that into a string so that I can concatenate it with this other stuff here. So each time the list goes through, it's going to say, instead of zero, one, two, three, four, it's going to say one, two, three, four, five. And then here I'm referring to each item in the basket by its index number. So when it prints the number one, it's going to give me item number zero, which is the first item in the list. So what it'll do is it'll print one more than the item number of the list and then the item itself. And it'll do that uh, one for each item one at a time. So it says one, apple, two, orange, three, banana, four, lemon, five, lime. And, and then it says, you can see there are, and so the nice thing about this is that I don't have to redo my code. If I add another fruit on there, it, now it says six fruits in the basket and list them like that. So um, this, so, the situations where you might want to refer to items to, to use the range to iterate through the range and then refer to the items by their um, index number instead of just iterating through the items themselves is the is the case where you might need to use the item number in some kind of calculation or to display or something like that. So um, this is a good example to sort of like puzzle over and make sure you understand how it works because we'll be doing this kind of trick actually in the, a lot of future examples. So um, that's the end of this of the lesson for today. As I said when we started, we're now actually in a position where we can do all kinds of cool things. We have the tools available where we could actually figure out how to solve some real problems. And so I really encourage you, uh, if you're able, to work on the homework for this week. So if you uh, go to the lesson webpage down here, there's some kind of, the, the homework problems are actually really pretty easy. 
And I would hope that everybody um, could figure out how to do them. Um, so what I recommend is uh, try doing the first problem and then on the second one, try doing part A and then part B and part C. And um, if you want, you can cheat and go down to the, if you get stuck, you can look at the code answers down in the bottom. Um, but I would encourage you to try to do them without looking at the answers and see if you can at least get homework problem one and two to work for next week. I also have some, what I think are really fun um, challenge problems. If you like games, this would be sort of like the first part of creating a card game. All it actually does is generate the random deck of cards. Um, so anyway, you can look at, um, at this code here and then there's some things for you to see if you can generate a poker hand and some things like that. So anyway, lots of fun that you can have with what we've learned so far. And I encourage you to, um, to try to do that for next week. And when we start off next week, if there are things you have trouble with, we will go ahead and uh, start with those. So with that, I am going to stop uh, sharing my screen, or I'm uh, sorry, stop recording. <laughs>